Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Brian Moreland of JB Knife and Tool. Along with friend John Stubbs, Brian makes some of the most coveted custom Pakal style fixed blade EDC knives out there. And they got my attention shortly after my interview with Ed Calderon when my fascination for Pakal style knives first blossomed. A year later, I bought one of their flagship knives, the Ditch Pick in double edged, uh, and it carries so easily and has so much. Uh, defensive capability in it that I'm already looking forward to my next acquisition, uh, just to round out the collection, if you will. Uh, but the work of JB Knife and Tool isn't just optimized for defensive tactics. Uh, they also have a lot of practical uh, tools also. Um, and they're easy on the eyes. And you know I get a lot of, put a lot of stock in that. So let's get right to it. But first, uh, please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And if you can't finish this episode in video form, remember to download it to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen on your way to work tomorrow or when you mow the lawn on Saturday. And if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying interview extras, knife giveaways, stickers, early access to the show, and more, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Hey, it's good to have you. Um, as I mentioned right up front, um, the the stuff that really got my attention from JB Knife and Tool are knives like this one uh, that I bought, the the ditch pick. But these Pickal style tip down edge in knives, right. which you guys accelerate at making. How did how did you where Thanks. did this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like all of your models, uh, of all of your models, my favorite are those, and you have a lot in that category. <laughs> how, how did this come about? This fa this fascination in particular. Uh, that fa so when when we started when we started making knives, we were heavy into like the bushcraft um, outdoorsy type knives because we both like to camp and hunt and fish and. Um, but I also train in Filipino martial arts and I really just wanted to start building knives that, that I was going to carry every day as a, as like a defensive tool. My wife had started training with me and she wanted a knife to carry as well. Um, so John and I just kind of switched gears and went on to, to start making knives that, that we wanted to carry as a tool every day um, or for defensive purposes every day. Uh, and that's, that's kind of how it started. The, uh, the first, real Pakal style blade that we created was the Sackett. Um, and that one was actually made for, uh, for my wife, uh, cause mm. she wanted, I wanted her to start doing a, a lot of, um, Pakal style work. And she was worried somebody was going to take the blade away from her cause she was tiny and had little hands. And, uh, so I started working reverse edge stuff and made the, uh, made the Sackett and put the finger notch in it for to, to kind of help keep it retained. And, um, there was a, there was a whole process to how we we came up with this design, and then uh, um, this kind of started started everything for it. Uh, so you uh, train in Filipino martial arts. What are you training in exactly? Uh, so I, I trained in uh, so I trained with a man named Mike Blackgrave here in San Antonio. Um, some people will know him. Some people like him. Some people absolutely hate him. Uh, he just has that kind of personality. But it, it was a illustrissimo based mm. uh, Filipino style. So. That's for the past whatever 10, 12 years. That's what uh, that's what I've done there with with regards to that. But um, I mean, I did Sayak for a little while. I did Pakiti Tertia for a little while as well. Um, but the Illustrissimo side was 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 what I stuck with. Uh, so uh, Pakiti Tertia, I've I've got some experience with Pakiti Tertia, <laughs> and uh, that seems especially optimized to this kind of. Um, this kind of tip down edge in knife, uh, even though I don't ever remember seeing a knife like this before recently, 
um, a lot of that sort of uh, uh, trapping with the in reverse grip uh, always seemed to me like it needed an edge on the inside. Yeah, yeah. So most uh, most Filipino based systems that 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 I've seen have some kind of pakal work in them. It's just not heavily done because there's so much emphasis put on that medium and long range, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, style. So that you know the reverse edge stuff doesn't really you know, that's not conducive for, for medium or long range. It's really more of an up close personal type. Um, but that's, uh, I'm more of a, I'm a big guy. I'm not super fast. So I like being close enough to grab a hold of you and close mm -hmm. enough to, you know, to, to get in tight. So I like the smaller blades with the reverse grip. And, and that's kind of how we, that, that's, that was always my thought process on, on that. So the very first uh, Pakal style knife you guys started to do was the one you have in your hand. And this was right. designed for your wife. What was it like? Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the experience and the considerations going into designing that knife. I mean, you designed it for your wife and the presumption is, oh, well, this is this is for a woman and she's smaller and weak. But it's something that everyone could use. Uh, right, tell, me, right. tell me what went into making that. So the, the reason I wanted to do like a reverse edge blade with her is specifically she had a fear of somebody coming up and grabbing her wrist and her not being able to use mm -hmm. the blade. So uh, with the edge on the inside, we worked a lot of just her dropping weight and stepping back and just trying to fillet everything that was in the way of that edge mm -hmm. and then coming back in, you know, with an attack. Um, she also had or has very small hands. So there's kind of a this neck point here if you if you grab a piece of clay and squeeze it you end up with a shape that looks about like that mm -hmm. and uh, that was how I wanted the handle to fit I wanted it to be comfortable in her hand uh, and not move and not slip and not you know uh, not get away from her so we did this kind of exactly that took a piece of clay gripped a hold of it and uh, and then ended up with this shape handle and smoothed the edges out I put the notch up here initially just so I knew that um, the edge wasn't on this side. The edge mm -hmm. is opposite of where my finger is, you know, mm -hmm. and tried to make it as super simple for her as possible. Um, and that's that's what went into the design for that. Um, and a funny story about this blade is uh, when I designed this and made this and we posted it, I didn't know who Craig Douglas was. Like, I didn't know who he was, what... You know what? Uh, and then so one day I get a phone call from Craig about, hey, man, I want to talk to you about your second. It looks a lot like the clinch pick. I didn't know what a clinch pick was at the time. So him and I talked and uh, and and worked everything out and everything was great. And he's a good, a good guy. But uh, this is this is uh, South Narc, Southern South, Narc, South Narc. Yeah, South Narc. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Because it, it bears a, a a glancing resemblance, but most knives bear a glancing resemblance of all well, others. At the time, it had a, uh, like the original one, uh, which I probably should have dug out. I have it in a box here. It's got a fatter handle to it. And okay. the blade steel was eighth inch stock instead of the 16th inch stock that we're doing the ditch series out of. Um, and really all he was concerned about is he didn't want, an, want us to have an egg shaped handle. And mm -hmm. I didn't want, I didn't want an egg shaped handle either i wanted flat sides um so it didn't rotate in my hand and it laid flat against me when i carried it um so we were we were square after that i was like yeah no i don't that's cool. we're good on the egg shaped handle deal he doesn't so, seem like the kind of guy you want to cross <laughs> no no and he's a super he's a gentleman i mean he's no a totally nice fella, so. uh for those who don't know uh uh i'm sorry what, what's his name i only know him by south Narc. Uh, craig douglas is his craig name. douglas he's south he's Mark is his instagram South Narcus's Instagram, and he's this, uh, he's a guy who has been talking about reverse edge uh, knife tactics for a long time from the context of undercover DEA kind of stuff, um, being, being in confined spaces like cars and such. And how do you fight if someone's, if you're grappling in a car and you're behind it, you know, so he's come up with a, with a whole, um, you know, Obviously, out of experience, he's come out of this whole use of that of that reverse edge. And um, uh, also, like you said, he is a gentleman. He posts uh, shots of him all dappered up, and he yeah. talks about how, <laughs> how you dress as a gentleman, too. It's pretty cool. This is how you eviscerate someone, and then this is how you dress nicely. <laughs> yeah, afterwards, to go have a drink and a smoke. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, about about um, 
I really like, okay, so uh, remind us of the model you're holding. So this this model is the uh, the ditch sacket. So um, there's a regular sacket that's a thicker stock, thicker handle. Um, this the ditch all the ditch series stuff is 16 right. inch steel, uh, thinner stock, thinner lay. Okay. So so something. Uh, all right. So I have a ditch series uh, pick the the right. ditch pick here, and uh, so it's very thin. That's one of the things I got this several months back. And on the show, I kept showing it off and, and I carry it frequently. And so when I do a pocket check on my show, I frequently have this. And something I always talk about is how how slender that blade stock is and how um, just, I mean, it slips through between atoms. It's so thin. Um, <laughs> but uh, one thing, uh, uh, so one thing I really love about this is the handle. I love that it's got a, a place to put your thumb on top to cap that. I love the shape of it. It reminds me of a, uh, you know, if you blew it up, it'd be like a, a cool Bowie, uh, you know, handle. It's a really greatly great shaped handle and I love it. And then I look at the sacket and that's also a really great shaped handle, different philosophy. I mean, it, it right. hides completely in your hand. Um, and like you said, it, it conforms exactly to your, your clenched fist. So it's a different style thing, but I love them both. And the thing I like about the sacket, just seeing it in your hand, is that there's no way someone's going to be able to pry that out of your hand. Like the most skilled right. knife knife man is not going to be able to use that punio to pry it out of your hand. Right, right. It's it's buried in there. Yeah, that's and that was my design. Again, like I said, my wife was super worried about somebody prying this out of her hand, so um, we went through different handle shapes, and and this was the one that we that we both agreed on that we both liked quite a bit. So how did uh, JB Knife and Tool start? <laughs> well, so I moved to San Antonio from Houston. Uh, and when I was living in Houston, I was working in a, a knife maker shop named Warren Thomas. Hmm. Um, and so I, I worked out of his shop for a while. He needed a CAD guy to do drafting work to, to get his blades cut. And I wanted to learn how to make knives. So it uh, it worked out pretty well. And then, so when I moved to San Antonio, I was making knives in my garage just for friends and family and whatnot. And, um, I worked at a, a an engineering company as a mechanical designer and they gave me kind of a, a, a partner to team up with, to, to work on some heavier projects and him and, and that was John and him and I hit it oh. off right away. And he, uh, he, uh, he wanted to learn how to make knives. So he started coming over and and we created JB Knife and Tool, and and uh, that was back in August of 2013, I think. And it was it was interesting at the time because he had a little shop set up in his garage. I had a little shop set up in my garage, so we would make components and then meet up at the day job because we shared an office. And then like so, like he made the handles and I made the blades, and then we would meet up and like assemble stuff, and then I would take it home and finish it, and then we'd bring it back to the office and box them up and ship them out. <laughs> so it's oh, man. super inefficient. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> super inefficient. But it yeah. made work fun to go to. <laughs> it did. Yeah, it, it was it was a ball. We had a All right. Time. So so philosophical question. Yes. You uh, with with what you can do and with what John could do, you could build anything, essentially any sort of product. Why knives? We like knives. I mean, I've always <laughs> liked. Yeah, I've always liked knives. And um you know, my grandpa gave me a little pocket knife that my dad gave him, you know, when I was eight years old. And then from then on, I got a knife every year from him for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of started, you know, the whole, the whole snowball. And, uh, and John's always been into outdoorsy stuff and things, and he wanted to make knives and it just kind of snowballed into us doing knives, but we do a lot of other stuff also. Like we make brass knuckles and we make uh, war clubs and we've made some swords and we do, you know, so there's a bunch of little one-off stuff that JB knife and tool has made for people. And there's, you know, people still in, in uh, certain parts of the service that call and, you know, Hey, I need this tool made, you know, to do a job. And I'm like, great. And we'll make a, a one-off little whatever for, for their <laughs> needs. So we enjoy just building anything, but, uh, but I've always had a love for, different types of knives and historical knives and trying to come up with new ideas and, and things like that. So uh, you mentioned that 
before you kind of got into your current groove, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pigeonhole you, but this right now seems to be your current groove. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Pical style self-defense knives and other self-defense knives and, and easy EDC utility knives. You have one right out the companion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but before you kind of got into that, you were, you were saying that you were making bushcraft knives and that kind of thing. What, what were those like? And, and, uh, we uh they were a lot of fun i mean we we camped a lot we did a lot of uh you know hunting and fishing like i said before so we were on um, kind of a bushcraft forum and we tried to follow the trends on there there's guys that like the american style puku knives and then there's you know um smaller camp knives that's actually when we started making the companion was uh when we were still hanging around with the bushcraft and camping guys because we would we would go we would go to a friend's property and he would put on this big event where it was like a, a, a all weekend kind of bushcraft class and hunting event out there. And uh, we made those companion knives as uh, blades for us to clean deer at the camp that year. And they worked great. So uh, then we made the companion XL and at, right after that, um, but we cleaned that's that was a knife we cleaned deer with at camp for you know for years uh, and it still stuck around and we still have a couple like this is the the this is mine it's Ooh. been beat beat to hell and back but this is the the edu and we still make this from time to time and uh, we have an edh which is a everyday hunter that's got a little bit wider like drop point blade a little bit wider blade um but we made these for for years also uh, and this is a knife I carry every day and, and work on. Uh, and we still will do drop them in batches and things from time to time also. So that's EDU everyday utility. Right. Right. Does that have a sharpened swedge on it? This one does not. Okay. Um, I did, I did make some with a sharp, like the one I made my dad's got a sharpened swedge. Um, I did another one like this that had, uh, it was completely double edged and it had a, mm -hmm axis uh, antler handle with leather spacers and it looked like a gambler's knife to me and that's what we called it the gambler we made a one-off of it and sold it and um still regret selling it because it was like my favorite uh -huh. one we've ever made but but uh, somebody wanted to buy it so we sold it and, uh, but it was a pretty one so now okay so now nowadays you make uh, the self-defense knives you make you make the companion um uh which i've seen you've you're doing a recent recently you've been doing a run of those right yeah, uh, yeah. so um oh and then there's that uh, bat wing which is so damn cool <laughs> that is a such a sweet looking blade uh if you can't you, see yeah. it, it it looks like my ditch pick which you've probably seen online except uh the outside edge has a uh is a recurve sort of tanto and the inside edge is a is a back swept um you know curvy sharpie edge right. so there you have an ice pick uh you have that sacket there's the companion uh to the left um uh so you 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 start you you make the shift where where do you get your okay so like i mentioned in my intro up front like i i really got tuned into you keyed into your work uh after i i had ed calderon on the show and i was really you know starting to get fascinated with um with the fruit knife and the the Elvia and the tip tip down edge in stuff. And then I key into your work and I'm like, okay, so here's someone doing it at a high level. This isn't just a Victorinox fruit knife with a bent handle and some jute wrapping. You know, this is a, this is like the real deal. How did you get, it seems like you're um, very well appreciated in the Libra fighting and, and Pical world, if that is a world. Uh, so how did you get kind of so firmly nestled in there and get a reputation there? Um, a, a lot of that is, is uh, a lot of that was through Ed. Um, Ed's been a, a huge help and support for us. Uh, we met him probably eight years ago now. Um, and through through a, a friend of his voodoo doc i don't know if y'all know yeah. who he is or what um but we did some work for for doc and then doc introduced us to ed um and and we kind of hit it off and he's been a huge help for us pushing our name out there and uh, testing our blades and if i had an idea that that i wanted to to do i would run it by ed i'd make one and i'd send it to him and tell him you know break this and tell me what needs to be fixed what needs to be wrong and and uh, and he's been a huge help um 
with with kind of streamlining the way our tools need to be built and and really getting away from things that are uh, useless or, or things that can, like ring. I don't like rings on knives. That's just my, you know, and I found out later, Ed doesn't like them either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then in one of the classes we hosted for him, we, he, we found out why they're bad to put on certain knives. We had a guy cut his finger up pretty bad in the ring and uh, split his hand open because the knife didn't go all the way past his palm. And Ed told him that's going to cut you if you use it. And he wanted to try it and he did it and split his hand open and, and uh, it was just bad, but uh, Ed was a huge part of of why we're we're where we are in the community. Um, and I think the other part of it is just communication. There seems to be a a breakdown between a lot of knife makers and the communication between their customers. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, John and I both have always tried to try to keep an open line of communication between, you know, so when our customers call back and say, Hey, this is uncomfortable because of this, that's a great idea. Send that knife back. Let me make you a new one and uh, I'll send it out. And now that fix has been put into the rest of the rest of the knives, you know? Um, and if they have a complaint about something, we've always been there to try to fix it for them and uh, word of mouth gets out and things kind of take off. Yeah. You know, I've thought about that uh, a bit about the communication issue, because you hear that a lot, Uh, whether it's from people who spend a lot of money on knives, on custom knives. And what do you expect from a maker? Well, I expect good communication or whether you hear it from, you know, someone such as yourself. And I think sometimes uh, it's, it's a temperament issue. Some people are more artist than businessman. And so they like to be holed up making their craft. And then, and then it comes time to actually do the business stuff. And, and, and I can relate to that so easily because that's, that's kind of me. I've, I've been forced to change that a little bit, but I would love to be holed up doing my thing and not (laughs) answering emails. Yeah, absolutely. uh, yeah, but I mean, at the I, I I completely understand that. Like, I can get lost in my shop for for hours, and like anybody would tell you, we're horrible at answering the phone because I can't hear it in the shop half the time. <laughs> right. You know, so the best way to get us is you know either message on Instagram or email. Um, and I mean, sometimes it takes a day or two to get to it, but when we get to it, we try to help them out with their problem and you know, and things like that. And you're never going to make everybody happy. There's always going to be somebody that's mad about something and they want to be mad about it, you yeah. know, but I mean, at the end of the day, these are the folks that are paying your bills. You yeah. know, they're the guys that are, they don't have to buy from me. There's a hundred other knife, thousand other knife makers out there that are making tools just as, just as nice as ours, if not nicer, you know? Um, so it benefits all of us. If, uh, if we just take the time or I take the time to, sit and chat with this guy on the phone or over email or, you know, fix the problem he has with his knife um, and not be a jerk about it. You know, and that seems to go along, seems to go a long way with folks when you just stop and take the time to, to chat with them or hear out their problem and fix it, you know? Yeah. You know, sometimes even if it's like, I can't, like, I saw your email, I can't really address it right now. Yeah, exactly. um, but I but I hear you. And this is something I've been told by friends in the past. Like, why didn't you call me? Well, I didn't have time. Well, you could have just said, I don't have time to talk. Yeah, I'm sure. like, oh, you're right about that. Um, <laughs> but before we move away from testing and Ed uh, Calderon, you said that yeah. uh, you will send him or you have in the past sent him prototypes uh, here. Ed, check this out. What do you think? And he gets back to you. Um, how does he test them? And then what kind of things have you learned from those tests? Well, so like, you know, he does the organic medium tests and the, the only reason I sent blades to Ed is Ed and I had become friends by that point. You know, I'm not going to just call up some random guy and be like, Hey man, test this, you know? (laughs) Um, but, but he's been such a huge help with talking to me about designs and different things. And so when we decided to go to this 16th inch steel, you know, there were reservations because it's so thin. I'm like, I don't know if it'll hold up. I don't know what to expect from it, you know? So we made some and I tested them in the shop, you know, I'm pounding them through two by fours and trying to stick them into metal drums and just like junk and crap I have in the shop. Um, But Ed does these classes, these organic medium classes. And so we made him a ditch pick, a single edge, reverse edge ditch pick. And I sent it to Ed. I'm like, tell me what you think, break it. You know, if it breaks, tell me where and how, and you know, if you have the time, because we're not paying him to do it and he's Mm -hmm. not under any obligation to do it or tell anybody about it, you know? Um, 
but as a friend, he was like, yeah, I'll do that. So I sent him one and he stuck it in a pig a bunch of times. And he's like, Hey man, this thing works, <laughs> this thing works well. So, uh, and he still has that knife, but, um, so we, we run a lot of things by him. We run a lot of things by doc, you know, experts that know how these blades are supposed to perform. And then when we go to, um, when we go to classes or we host classes, we'll bring out new designs we're working on. And when the class is done using the, the, the organic medium test that we're doing there, then we have free reign to test out all of our new stuff. And the class likes to see that too, because sometimes things will break. Sometimes things don't work out like they're planned. And, you know, we kind of go back to the drawing board on it, but, uh, but it's always fun. It's always fun to watch. So. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I just, uh, the, uh, the years of doing martial arts, having someone show up with a new knife was always like, ah, oh, you know, everyone crowds around, but if it's someone who's making it, that's even cooler. Yeah. I got to say, fun. and, and bring in prototypes and, and not for nothing. I mean, I, I, I have full faith in this knife, but knowing that this 16th of an inch, uh, you know, this is kind of like a steak knife basically in terms of its thickness right. and knowing that it's, uh, it's been tested, uh, not only by, uh, you know, Ed in, in pig carcasses, but you and your shop pounding it through two by fours and stuff like that. That's not something I'm willing to do with this, but I love knowing it's been through that, um, you know, that ringer. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is Good. thin and we're used to, you know, I, I'm used to having big, thick chunks of metal sure. and, yeah. and, uh, really, I guess, uh, that's, that's one thing, but this is another thing. And, and it's not necessary to have that huge chunk to have a stout knife. Well, and that was kind of our thought too, is because uh, like the original sackets were five thirty seconds, which for the size blade, that's thick, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, it's a little over an eighth of an inch, and uh, you know, it was it was fairly stout. And then we went to an eighth of an inch, and I'm like, oh, I like this a lot better. Um, and then John and I were having a conversation at lunch one day. And I'm like, why do they have to be this thick at all for what they're doing? You know, we're not pounding them. You know, it's not like a camp knife. I'm not pounding mm -hmm. it through a, an old piece of oak or having to try to shave off, you know, pieces of wood to make a fire. And, you know, it doesn't need to do any of that. It needs to go into meat and come back out, you know? So that's when we started messing with the thinner and thinner stocks. And, and uh, you know, people talked crap about it at first and, you know, that's never going to work. And then we started testing them and showing the testing. And, and now we've got, there's all kinds of people doing 16th inch steel stuff now. And hmm. uh, it, so it's, uh, it's just, you know, the way this industry evolves, but, um, it's a lot of fun for us. So. Oh yeah. Well, another really important part about it is that these are, these are meant to be everyday carry items. They're meant to be easily carried and, and 16th of an inch. I mean, this knife, this knife is like featherweight. It's very, very light. Right. Yeah. And you know, yeah. 16th of an inch thick steel. It's going to be light. You're going to carry it more often. I carry this knife a lot. And that's probably one of the reasons it's very low profile, you know? And, uh, um, I think the weight is a big issue. Yeah. And I, and I think so too. And I, like I said, I enjoy carrying a lighter, a lighter knife, but there are times when I want a, a, like you said, a big thick honking piece of steel, you know, if I'm out camping or if I'm making a big long blade that needs to lop through something, you know, I want to have some, some weight, some mass behind it. Yeah. Uh, but for these EDC knives, these everyday carry knives, I don't like to go much thicker than an eighth of an inch, you know, if we, it does because it doesn't need to be, you know, we're not prying with it. We're not, you know, at least the ones that I'm making here have a certain purpose, you know, like the companion and the companion XL we've pried with those, you know, John and mm -hmm. I wore those as work knives when we were working at the same uh, engineering research company, um, you know, and we used them to scrape old gaskets off of flange faces and Hey, I can't quite get this nut loose off of this flange. No problem. I'll just hammer the knife between the flange and let it, you know, separate the two pieces of pipe. Like we beat them up bad, right. and, uh, but that was, you know, that's kind of our job, right? Is to, to beat on them a little bit and, and see what they'll do and when they'll break. And uh, when customers call in and they're like, Oh, I don't know what happened to my knife. It just, I put it in my pocket one day and I took it out and the next day it's solid rust. And I'm like, that looks like you left it in a fish tackle box. And I know that because <laughs> I've, I've done, done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, so uh, times have changed since uh, the days where you came into lunch and showed him what you did and he showed you what he did and all that. So how, what's, what's your working relationship like with John? Um, 
in terms of designing and then in terms of building? How do, how does all that look like? Um, it's, it's getting pretty, uh, streamlined now. I mean, so, so I, I work in the shop full time now, uh, and Brandon comes in with me and helps my son, my oldest boy, he comes in and helps me. Um, and then John comes in, um, when he can come in either early in the morning, cause he still has a day job. So he mm -hmm. comes in either early in the morning before his day job, or um, maybe for like an hour at lunch or uh, after his day job, before he goes and picks the kids up, he can swing by. Um, but he does a lot of the, he does a lot of the stuff that keeps the business running that, uh, that I don't want to do, you know, or <laughs> that I can't, you know, he, you know, takes care of the taxes, paperwork, make sure all the materials ordered, make sure um, everything's shipping out on time. Um, that there's a staggering amount of work involved in just those pieces, but he also does like the programming for all the, the CNC machines. Like when we cut the handles and, and, uh, um, those, and for when we cut the, the Kydex sheaths and stuff like that, like he has to sit and program all this stuff. That's things he can do at home. He doesn't have to come to the shop to, mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and then he'll come to the shop one morning or, or on a Saturday and we'll sit and, okay, here's the new program. We'll test cut the handles okay these are great and then i can run the machine you know while he's at the day job so it's it's progressed quite a bit since we both had two little bitty shops at our house but uh it's, it's a pretty decent workflow now one day i'll get him on full time but he does <laughs> he does have a really good job so it's uh it's hard to walk away from that yeah i hear that so uh your shop is a a, a place where you go and and seek refuge and make knives and you bring your son Yes. Uh, okay. So he's the gentleman I've seen in the pictures on your Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's him. So how do you like working with your son? I enjoy, I love it. I mean, he's a, uh, he's a blast to have in the shop. I mean, he, he, uh, he's got autism and he's, uh, he's fairly high functioning. And so it's always an adventure. You know, a lot of times he's super quiet. You don't know he's there until he's like self-talking and, and doing his shows and stuff like that. But if you give the boy a task to do, say, Hey man, I need you to do this. Cool. Never complains, never gripes. He just gets up and goes to work. Now you can't be in a hurry for what he, you have him doing because it's going to take, it's going to take all day, you know, but it'll get done and it'll be perfect. Yeah, I was going to say know? perfect. But, probably. Yeah. It'll be spot on, but uh, it's going to take a little while, but he uh, recently had his own project that uh, doc gave him an idea for uh, his own project. And that was those wooden handled ice picks oh yeah. man those were okay all right so that was his that was his baby I, I got to teach him how to use a chop saw how to use a wood lathe how to use the grinder and how to assemble all those pieces together uh and he did all of it himself and he made 124 pieces hmm. uh, which was a lot and uh, he worked his tail off on that but didn't complain didn't you know he never gripes so it's uh he's a lot of fun to, to have in the shop he's a hard worker is he going to do those again? I was just because before I'm sorry to interrupt That's you okay. before this interview, I was I was going back through your Instagram. But I was like, oh, I remember those. Like I, I I remember when he was making those, and they're they're like wooden. They're like they're about I don't know, um, maybe ten inches long, wooden yeah. uh, circular wooden with finger grooves on one side. You pull it apart, and it's a nice right. pick. Yeah, so cool. So he uh, and and I love him because his innocence is is amazing right so we made the prototype and i was looking and that's the prototype there um cool. we made the prototype and i was looking all over the place for it in the shop one day because i wanted to take another picture and send it to doc and i couldn't find it and so i asked brandon brandon where's the ice pick he's like it's in the freezer in the ice bag and i'm like why is it why is it in the freezer he's like because it's an ice pick what else are you gonna do with an ice pick <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, like, I love that good, good point buddy you're <laughs> absolutely right and there so, he is <laughs> Well, uh, uh, a little known fact about our producer, Jim, who works behind the scenes here, he has an ice pick collection. He's, nice. he, yeah, he's got some really cool old antiques of various sorts. And one of his, one of his uh, things to collect are ice picks. So I thought he might like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We will, we will get one. Brandon is doing a small batch right now. Um, and it's mainly for uh, some friends of ours that uh, weren't able to get on, on the, uh, the original order, right? Um, but I'm trying to talk him into doing another run, you know, Hey, let's just do another run of like 50, you know, ice picks. And, uh, he's thinking about it right now. He's very much a, 
we already did that. Why would we do it again? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, but so I'm trying to talk them into doing another run. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But I'll definitely, I'll definitely let you know, and I can put you in this new batch that we're doing now. Oh, it's, that'd uh, be that'd be outstanding. Uh, it'll be fun. Uh, that, that's one of the things uh, I really like. Um, you know, I've talked to a lot of knife makers on this show, and I love family um, uh, family businesses in one way or another. I love hearing about family members working with family members. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a cool thing to be able to share because, um, you know, love for knives is a, is, is a, maybe, maybe a, f from the outside just a little bit offbeat. But those of us who love knives love knives. And to be able to right. share that with someone and then also to be able to, you know, someone you love like your son and then to be able to build them and build something with them together. I think that's part of this American dream. I keep talking about like uh, yeah, knife yeah, makers seem to sure. live the American dream. Doesn't mean it's not hard. Doesn't mean yeah, you're not working no, your butt off the whole time. But Absolutely. Yeah. But no, he's, uh, he, he's, he's a lot of fun to have in the shop. Ed calls him the best hype man ever because if you've ever seen any of his videos he uh if you've ever met brandon in person like he's super quiet all the time and then you turn a camera on and you get what you know those videos that we have on our page none of that is scripted that is his him going dad grab your phone i want to make a video I'm like, cool man so i grab it and and he goes off and the my favorite one i think is when we were introducing the goblin knife and uh, he did that creepy, weird voice when he says the <laughs> goblin every time. And it was uh, it was funny. But he's definitely built his own little following on our on our page of people that are there for the Brandon videos. Yeah, so it, yeah. Uh, I noticed that. He's a riot. So uh, tell me a little bit about the business of not like what have you learned about being um, about doing this and being full time in the knife business? Um, what kind of what kind of lessons have you learned? Um you've got you've got nobody to blame but yourself you know that's one of the biggest things you you have to hold yourself accountable for things that so we're working in an industry that is huge um and if you build up any kind of following there's no reason um i say there's no reason to not be doing well but you know you can you can sit on your butt and you complain complain about all the things that are going wrong or you can get off your butt and go out and work and when you get off your butt and you go out and work, um, then all the good things that you want start happening, you know, and it's I, I tell my wife all the time. I, what I love about running my own business is the amount of work I put in directly correlates with how much money we get to bring home, mm -hmm. you know, and I know that's not always the case, you know, but, you know, if you want to if you want to be successful, you got to put in you got to put in the work. Um, the other thing is running your own business is really hard because it's real easy to to not hold yourself accountable and be like, you know, I could sleep in until, you know, 10 today. And it's, you know, but you're missing out on all that time. You could be in the shop working and making money. Um, so at the very beginning, that was hard for me because all of a sudden I didn't have a boss. I didn't have anybody telling me I had to be at work at any certain time. I didn't have, you know. But then all of a sudden, you still got to pay bills. You know, your rent still due, your car note still due, your kids need food and clothes and and everything else. And uh, it's uh, for me, it's really helped push my work ethic a little bit harder. I mean, I've always been one to try to work myself to death anyway. But uh, that's that's been a big part of it. The other thing is trying to find a balance between getting in there and working and saving enough time to come home and play with the kids and and uh, there was some fluctuation there for a little while because it's like, well, okay, if I spend 18 hours in the shop, then I can get this much stuff done. Mm -hmm. And then this much money to come home. And, but then you're too tired and you're too, uh, don't have enough time to go spend that money with the kids and, and family and whatnot. So it's trying to find that balance between the two is, was another lesson to, to be learned. And I think we've hit a pretty good stride right now and, uh, and we're enjoying things quite a bit. So. Yeah, it seems like that uh, initial, be you know, that beginning of a business or of any venture. Uh, I've never really started up a, a business per se, but um, it requires that kind of devotion in the beginning. And it's a sacrifice. And, you know, the sacrifice is now for later. And, right. uh, and you know, if you hadn't have put in 18 hours a day initially, 
you might be still in the shop right now tonight. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's true. Yeah. I mean, and it's, you find a balance and you find, um, you know, the, one of the hardest things for me to break was, and John and I talked about this quite a bit because he still, he still has a day job. So he still works, you know, eight, essentially eight to five. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you get that 40 hour a week mindset, you know, um, but when you put in the work up front, like anytime you're starting a new business, you're putting in a ton of time, a ton of hours at the beginning. And now we're at a point where we kind of have a rhythm to things and we have a, um, you know, a process. So I don't have to do that 40 hours, you know, or eight to five mindset this week. I just have to make sure that I get X amount of blades out the door. Mm -hmm. So it's a different mindset. Instead of thinking, you know, of, I have to have 40 hours in this week. I say, okay, I have to have 50 knives done this week. You know, now that might take me seven days, you know, that week, depending on what I'm doing, or it might take me three and a half or four. And then I've got a couple of days where I can go spend time with the wife and kids, you know, because I got that 50 knives done that covers all our bills, extra money, salaries, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so when you start looking at things in, in terms of, okay, how many knives does it take this week to get what we need done, done? Um, it takes a lot of stress off, you know, because now I don't feel like I'm in the shop today, but all the knives are ground, all the handles are done. What am I supposed to do today? You know, and it's, uh, it kind of takes that part out of it when I can just focus on, okay, we have to make sure that we have this batch done, you know, this many knives done and not have to worry about how much time you're actually putting in the shop. Uh, well, you, you, you mentioned rhythm and that that's, uh, that's a good word. I mean, because once, once you kind of get in a rhythm or in a groove, you know, you know, things are going well, how does, how does that rhythm work with um, the production of knives in terms of like runs of knives? I know when I bought this ditch, this ditch pick uh, several months back, you announced that you were, uh, working on a batch of them. How does that work? Uh, how you release models and stuff? Okay, so this this has been uh, this has been a process for John and I to figure out for a while. So, if, you know, we had the whole, you know, custom. We we did the whole custom thing for a while, where you could get on the web page and pick what blade you want, what steel you want, what handle color, shape, grind, mm -hmm. blade grind. You know, and what it did was it <clears throat> just bogged us down time wise. You know, where it should only take us a week to knock out a certain amount of blades it's taken us three weeks because now i've got to cut an individual set of you know neon green handles because it's got, you know you know what i mean so yeah it yeah. was just all these different layers to it um and we were just getting super burned out on it so we went to we went to doing batches so i say okay this week i want to do you know ditch picks i want to just work on ditch picks so we'll get um, you know, we, we do the CAD file up, send it to the water jet guy and have him cut out however many ditch picks will fit on a sheet of steel that we can get. It might be 50, might be a hundred. Okay. And then I can say, okay, over the next week, I need to do 50 of these ditch picks for a drop. Okay. So now I need to cut out 50 handles and get 50 sets of sheaths done. Uh, and that's minimum that's to meet orders. And now I can get extras done if I have time. So that way in two more weeks, when I want to do another ditch pick drop or ditch sacket drop or whatever we were working on, um, I've got these extras set aside. So now I've already got these 15 that have already been made that weren't part of the original 50, you know, that we did over here. So now I only need to make 20 of this knife or 30 of this knife or whatever to, to do that. Um, and, and it just helps us focus on, you know, one or two things. Like we might be working on two batches at a time, but it's still just two, two, two designs, you know, and I know I'm going to do half of this batch reverse and half of this batch reverse and half belly. And this one's going to be double edge and this one's going to be reverse. And I know I have a certain amount to make so I can get in and just get into a rhythm. I've got a hundred knives to grind over the next two weeks. I've got this many reverse, this many double edge, and you can just get in there at the grinder and go to town. Not have to worry about anything. Uh, you know what, that, that this, this reminds me kind of, of something I learned at work, um, uh, at a different job, but it carries through every job I've been to, which is, um, you know, I'm in a creative field. And when you give someone, uh, endless options, 
they have, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, they feel an obligation to exercise right. uh, those options and to, <laughs> to make things as difficult on you as possible. Yeah. Not, not on purpose, of course, but, right. you know, right. of course, if someone comes up to you and says, here, uh, you can have this any way you want it, you're going to be like, well, hmm, <laughs> you know, so, uh, but, but your product is specific and desirable. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you're not just a general purpose. I mean, you do make general purpose knives, but you're you're more of a niche um, business. You know, you're making a niche product in a lot of right. ways, and 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 that that itself is the special part. Like, who 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 needs uh, you know uh, um, ebony handles on this knife? I mean, it would be cool, of course, but I mean, that's not part of what it's really about. It's not a um, it's it's not an art knife. It's a it's a it's a for use knife. Right. You know, right. I mean, and that's so our goal right now is to get the production side of things the way we're doing now um, set up to where I mean, the knives are all still hand ground. Right. So I'm still grinding all the blades by hand. Um, we use a CNC machine to cut the handles. I use a CNC machine to cut the sheaths now, which is a new thing for us. Nice. Uh, we got a vacuum mold, all this kind of stuff that we that's, can. That's your new pancake sheaths. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I mean, mainly we started doing it because I wanted repeatability. You know, before I was making all the sheaths by hand. You oh, know, God. cutting them out on the bandsaw, and when you're trying to knock out fifty knives for the week, you know, or a hundred blades for, it, it gets time consuming. So we were trying to streamline everything, and I'm also trying to create jobs in the shop that I can sit Brandon down and have him do. You know, buddy, this is your job. You know, you got to cut this Kydex, put it on this mold and hit that button, you know, and if it's something repeatable, he can come in and knock that out. So that's a task he can do and something I can pay him for as, you know, as an employee. Um, but we're trying to get it set up to where Brandon or maybe a couple of people come in and they can knock out this bread and butter stuff. I'm still grinding all the blades, but then that'll leave me time to work on small batches of just full custom. I'm hand shaping the handles. I'm back to forging blades out, you know, all of this mm -hmm. kind of stuff and doing like limited runs of like small one offs or, or whatever that I really want to make, you know, yeah. uh, I get a, get an idea in my head where, you know what, this EDU would look really nice with some, you know, mammoth ivory and, you know, a Damascus <sighs> blade. And then I've got time to sit down and put time into that instead of feeling like I have to rush it you know yeah yeah that makes perfect sense you know you get you get something i'm not you know through humans somewhat automated you know and kind of rolling on its own and then you can of course this whole period of time you've been making these i'm sure all these ideas for these have come up that you've not been able to um you know uh check out or explore because you've got you've got knives to make you know you've right, got these right. to pump out but I'm sure you have thought about this in Damascus with a, by the way, this would look so cool <laughs> in Damascus <laughs> with a, uh, you said, you said, uh, um, uh, mammoth, mammoth ivory, ivory. Yeah. and man, I'm a sucker for mammoth ivory. How it's cool been, would that look? It's been on my mind for a long time. And we actually have a, a guy in the shop. Um, uh, Chris Aguayo is, um, he owns bare metal creations and he, he's a blacksmith knife maker and he shares space in our shop with us, but he makes his own Damascus in the shop and it's mm. gorgeous. Um, and we definitely have different um, types of knife designs. Like we're definitely on different ends of the spectrum design wise, but the Damascus he makes is beautiful. Um, and so there's been times where he's made me a little Damascus billet for, you know, a small private knife. So I want to do that for a ditch pick or a mini pick, you know, um, something I can show off his work on as well. So it's coming. I just need time. I just need time to work on it. So you mentioned before forging out knives. Is that how you started? Were you actually forging? So I started in stock removal working for Warren Thomas. Okay, um, yeah. And then uh, when I moved to San Antonio, I had a friend of mine that was a, a knife maker that was a blacksmith and a, and a bladesmith. And so I started going and hanging out with him at his house. And then when he quit and went into bow making, um, I bought his anvil and his forge from him. Uh, and so I started forging blades for the bushcraft, you know, community and whatnot. Um, and we still were doing stock removal also, uh, but I was doing a lot more forge blades there as well. Um, and I still do some from time to time that are um, just private knives. I make them for family. I make them for friends. Uh, and I don't, 
sell them and I don't sell them right now on purpose because I don't want to have to, I don't want people asking me to make more. I know yeah. that sounds stupid, but I don't want to tell people no until I have the, you know, or I don't want to show it until I have the time to actually sit and, and do it uh, for real for folks. So that's the, that's the plan with the whole kind of mid tech thing that we're doing uh, or trying to get towards so that I have more time to work on forging and custom stuff. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Uh, um, hang on. You said the word mid tech. I want to expl- I want to <laughs> check that out for just a quick second. But sure, sure, before sure. we do, what do you get? Uh, um, all right, it's going to sound corny, but what what do you get uh, spiritually out of forging, and, and what do you get spiritually out of stock removal? And and I, I think you can tell from this from this question. I feel like forging is a isn't isn't is one of those processes that's a little bit transcendent. I don't know. It's a, um, it's just another creative outlet to, to kind of get you to the same, to get you to the same end goal, right? I can make the same knife and I've done this with the, we have a bigger blade called a Sanzibar that we've sold a few of. Um, the very first one of that knife was forged and I have it in the trunk of my car. You know, it's a big forged, um, uh, 24 inch blade, you know, curvy, like recurve short sword essentially is what it was. Um, they're both the same design, but they're both completely different. Um, and as far as like the spiritual aspect of it, to me, I love designing and I love making things. So stock removal is just one way for me to make whatever it is I've designed. And there's something therapeutic for me, um, at sitting at the grinder. I don't know why it's my favorite part. I mean, it's the part that kills my body the most, you know, but I love standing at the grinder, putting my headphones on, you know, listening to some music or an audio book or something, or just putting earmuffs on so I don't hear anything else and just being alone with my thoughts while I sit there and grind blades, you know, um, that's my, that's my absolute favorite part, um, to this, uh, as far as the stock removal goes, I mean, the uh, forging goes, it's the same thing. It's kind of a therapeutic, um, it's kind of a, it's got a therapeutic asset to it because you're watching the, the blade change color when it goes from forging temperature to cool. You know, you're trying to get your strikes in before it gets to a certain temperature. You're trying to manipulate the steel like Play-Doh to try to get it to become the shape that you want. You know, it's a whole different aspect of getting that design to come to life, you know? So there's definitely two different feelings to it. Um, but I don't feel like one is more or less, um, better or worse as far as like total outcome to it. Um, and we've had that conversation with a lot of our friends that are stock removal guys versus forging guys and, and things like that. But, um, forging to me, a lot of times is it's a lot of work to get to that blank that I get back from the water jet guy. Right. (laughs) Right. So I asked that corny question and, and because to me, forging is still a bit of a mystery. I mean, I've watched every forged in fire and I've, I even sat in on a few forging classes, but it's still, you know, I've never done it myself and it still feels like mystery. You know, you're applying heat to this element and then you're pounding it out and who knows, I don't know. It's kind of the right color, you know, to yeah, me, yeah. to me, it seems a lot, a lot more, <laughs> you know, whereas I, I understand the concept of taking a plate and removing everything that's not a knife. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's a science to it. Um, for, for sure, like making sure your steel is the right temperature and there's different ways that people get, um, I, my, my daughter has a new kitten and she's driving me crazy. (laughs) (laughs) She is obsessed with this computer right now. Um, but she, there's a, there's definitely a science to knowing like, um, what does 1500 degrees look like, you know? color wise on that steel, how close can you get it, you know, by eyeball. Uh, and that has a lot to do with how much ambient light do you have in your shop? You know, how dark is it? How, uh, what type of forge are you, you know, are, do you have cold spots in your forge? Are you getting an even heat all the way through? You know, there's a definite science to forging and it is, um, much more, there's, I will say there is, there is more skill and more work involved in forging a blade then there is stock removal of a blade, but there is still a lot of work and a lot of science that goes into the stock removal side um, of things as well. Whether you're cutting it out with a bandsaw or whether you're trying to program a CNC machine to do 
what you need to do. There's still a lot of, you know, thought involved in it and a lot of, uh, just a lot of work, uh, one way or the other. It's just, the work is just different. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the term mid tech before, and I know what you were, you were referring to what you had just been talking about, not automation, but a way to get your, your, um, process even more streamlined with the help of other people so that you can focus on more, uh, personal projects right, while these right. other knives are, are going, but have you, um, considered or thought about or been approached or anything about uh, collaborations uh, with production companies? It, it seems like your your designs would be just so ready for that. We we have. We've talked to uh, to a few. And I mean, we might we might consider it down the line as well. Um, I just I like having control of my own <laughs> stuff. You know, it's uh, I can't help it. I, it's hard to let go of that uh, of that control. But I like to know that that I made what we put out there if that makes any sense but um you know for us it's um we started cutting the handles because it was a way to speed up the process of of making the knives right so we started cnc cutting all the handles so that we would get repeatability um and then we started um you know we bought the vacuum mold and and started cnc cutting the the sheaths for the same thing and because we have these handles that are repeatable, that makes the sheath process repeatable. And all of that just kind of speeds up, you know, but the heat treat's still done by us, the grinding's still done by us. Um, if I have enough, um, if I have enough time in between batches, I will absolutely send blades over to someone like Peter's Heat Treat or some professional heat treat company to, um, to heat treat those blades because that's two weeks worth of work that, I can be doing something else, you yeah. know, because if I get uh, 200 knives in and I have to sit and heat treat 200 knives, and that takes a long, it takes a long time. Uh, so if I can send it to someone like that, that I get a certificate back saying it's this hardness, um, I will absolutely use that, uh, that shortcut. Um, heck, if I can figure out a grinding jig that uses a can where I could stick Brandon on the grinder and knock those things out, I'll do that too. <laughs> but, um, but there's still like our one-off stuff and there's still something therapeutic about sitting at the grinder and grinding blades and, and all that. But uh, as far as mid tech goes, I think if you're still grinding blades by hand um, and you're still doing the heat treat and you're doing, you know, the fit and finish of the handles and the sheath, all that has to be done by hand. Also, you know, I get a rough handle off the CNC machine. I could probably put more time in and contour it and clean it and all that kind of stuff. But I like having the final say so on that handle when it's mm -hmm. done. You know, I like putting the final buff on that, you know, the edge of that sheath when it's, you know, when it's comes comes off the machine and I assemble it together. You know, there's something to that that I like. But we have talked about going towards um, I've got an old Bridgeport CNC machine in the back of the shop that uh, we have been rebuilding. And if I can get that thing to put bevels on a, a blade and then I come back and sharpen it, then we'll have a mid tech line. You know, it won't <laughs> be a, it won't be like a, you know, a custom knife or anything. It'll be a mid tech knife. Um, and then I can do mid techs and then focus on custom handmade one-off stuff. Well, that would be cool. <laughs> I, I would love, <laughs> I'd love to see where your custom uh, one-off stuff looks like. What do you, what are you guys working on? What do you have? Um, that you can reveal here that you're working on uh, for future designs uh, in knives. Well, we uh, we've been we've been doing so. The future stuff that we haven't released yet, um, we're working on a trench knife. We've had people ask us for a <laughs> trench knife for a while now, and uh, our our good buddy Doc called and said, "Hey guys, I need you to make a trench knife." So. Uh, so now we're making a trench knife and we've got uh, we've got a few designs coming up that are designed by Voodoo Doc uh, that I think are going to be uh, amazing. Some of them, uh, a few of them people got to see at the at Ed and Doc's Cleveland class um, when we had an organic medium there. We took the fast blades and the street sweeper sacks out there. Um, and so I'll have some pictures of those up soon. I think there's a. a couple of people that have pictures of the fast blades out right now. I haven't posted them yet, but some of the guys that were at the class have posted pictures of the, of Doc's fast blade. Um, so we've got that, the trench what, knife. 
So I'm Go assuming ahead. the trench knife has knuckle dusters, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, what's the fast knife? The fast knife is a um, is a blade that that was designed by Doc to be used in um, some of the combatives classes that he's going to be teaching, and it's got a it's got a it's got a hooked handle on it. Mm -hmm. The hook comes back this way. Edge is still facing um, that way. And it's so that you, the web of your hand can catch that hook as you draw oh, it out of your, okay. um, and it's a thinner stock blade. And I've got some, I should have sent you some pictures of it uh, today. I'm, I apologize, but um, I think his name is Josh Goodpasture has some on his Instagram page right now that he took. His photography is amazing. So um, I know that he took a couple of pictures of it. We also have a tomahawk coming out that was designed by Doc as well to be used for for combative work, you know, in his field of what he does. And so um, we also tested that at the Cleveland class. So there's guys out there that can attest to how well that did on a pig as well. But it's a compact tomahawk um, and it's super fast. So we uh, were really looking forward to, to finishing that guy up. God, I can't wait. I love tomahawks too. Uh, let's see. There's my prized Ed Roosh right behind yes, me. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. Elmer Roosh. I always call him Ed Roosh. Elmer Roosh. <laughs> uh, I love, I love the tomahawks. Uh, so I'm going to have to look up, uh, I'm going to have to look up this fast knife, uh, to find out what that's all about. So tell us, uh, tell listeners how they can get in touch with you and in, uh, with JB Knife and Tool and the best way to go about getting their hands on one of your knives. So the best, so to get in touch with us, if you have any questions or any anything that you would like to talk to talk about, the the best way to get a hold of us is is on Instagram. Uh, just send us an Instagram message. We try to get to all of them. It might take us a couple of days, but we try to get to all the messages and answer them. Um, the second best way would be through email on our website. Um, phone calls, as much as I would absolutely love to talk to everybody, because I, I do like to talk to folks. Uh, I never hear the phone in the shop. I'm so sorry, but it's, uh, it's loud in there, man. Yeah. Um, if you so, hear the phone, you're not doing it right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, we got a power hammer running, got grinders going. It's loud in there. Um, so those, that's probably the best way to get a hold of us. Um, and look out on our Instagram page for when we drop our batches, if there's a certain knife or product that you're looking forward to, if you go to our website, um, there's a waiting list under each product. So if, if there's something you like, join the waiting list for it. When, uh, when we get a bat, when we're doing a batch of those, we will send you an email about a day or two before we drop them on Instagram. So the waiting list folks get first dibs and then everything that's left over gets put on as an Instagram drop. All right. Well, there you heard it. Then Brian, thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast. Appreciate it's been it. a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh, a good time. yeah. And thanks for this really, really awesome knife. If very I, glad you, like you know, it. I'm very glad <laughs> that someone's making it. I'm glad you guys are making it. Thank <laughs> you. It. All right. Visit the knife junkie at the knife junkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. There he goes, Brian Moreland of JB Knife and Tool. Go check them out on Instagram, JB Knife. Uh, just making some really, really cool uh, EDC fixed blades, uh, most of which tend towards the self-defense, but they also have some pretty straight-ahead practical offerings as well. It's just a matter of timing to uh, to get in. A lot of people want their knives, so keep an eye out for them. Also, keep an eye out for the next podcast uh, with another great Knife World luminary. And uh, of course, there's Wednesday, the supplementary show where I show off uh, knives that are coming across my desk and uh, talk about certain features, uh, you know, at length. <laughs> and then of course, Thursday night, Thursday night knives is our live stream where you can come join the conversation right here on screen with us. Uh, so be sure to check us out, uh, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.